Now, that's another thing. Let me tell you this. It may surprise some of you. You know, everybody doesn't relate to the same God. Do you know what people really relate to? People relate to their concept of God. And you've got to be careful about it. You've got to be diligent about that. That you are not relating to or serving somebody else's negative concept of God. Uh -uh. Go ahead and clap. You want to clap. Write this question down. Whose concept of God am I relating to? Let's hear it. You see, some people relate to that concept of a stingy God. <laughs> I shucked him. Come on, say that. Come on, shuck him with your hands. Says, I shucked him. Some people have such a stingy concept of God that they even pray stingy prayers. Now, Lord, give me this and I won't ask for that. You're laughing because some of you sinners have done it. <laughs> That's right, we were going to have confession. How many of you ever made a stingy deal with God? Uh-huh, see that? You don't have to do that as if it's going to hurt God. <laughs> shuck that one. You see, there needs to be a whole lot of God shucking. This is why in the Old Testament, the prophets were continually telling the children of Israel, or those who know the law of the Lord, to stop worshiping false gods. A stingy God is a false God. Let's hear it. A stingy God is a false God. And then there's the God of the Reverend Jonathan Edwards, an early preacher during the colonial days that was famous, among other things, for preaching that sermon, sinners in the hands of an angry God. And he could preach hellfire so hot that people in the congregation would feel the fires of hell burning them and would run screaming to the altar to be saved. But of course, as soon as the hellfire is cooled off, they backslid again. <laughs> so what are we really dealing with here? Different people's concepts of God. Now you'd better examine your concept of God. Put down on your paper somewhere, what is my concept of God? Is it a stingy God? Is it an angry God? <laughs> is it an honorary God? Is it a God that doesn't want me to have anything nice? Shuck all those gods. <laughs> the Christians have some nice concepts of God, but you've got to be choosy. I like that concept of God bespoken in that beautiful hymn. I think it's by Fanny Crosby. And he walks with me. And he talks with me. And he tells me that I am his own. I like that fella. Let me hear you say that. I like that fella. Say, the Lord who is my shepherd and provides all of my needs so that I shall not want. I can relate to him or her or it to cover all you people in the God supermarket. <laughs> and one reason I like this teaching is because, very frankly, to tell you the truth, people who come to teaching such as this, you really discover that. That, well, you know, all this stuff I heard about God all the time, as the, as the old song says, Tain't necessarily so. <laughs> Tain't so that God wants me to be poor. Let me hear you say that. Tain't so that God wants me to be poor. And you know, you know who that angry God is? It's a man's or a mind's own anger at himself. You see, so, you know, God is not really not what the general populace thinks. And I'll tell you this, God is definitely not what the theologians think. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> she was expecting lightning to strike me and wondered why I didn't. <laughs> So you see, that's one of the things you learn here. You learn to think for yourself. And again, talking about the way God operates. You see, you got to watch God, how he operates. Starts right off there in that first book of Genesis. Boy, it's good you, you, you weren't there. You would have said, God, you better get out of here. It's too dark. <laughs> but God said, let there be light. One translation translates that in just two words, be light. The light flashed on and the darkness ran for cover. Everything God wanted. God wanted fish in the oceans. God wanted animals. God wanted stars, the sun, the moon, everything that God wanted. God said what? Let there be. And I love the way it follows. And there was. Please let me rub this in. Let me be redundant with this. Because if you just get this point, it'll be worth all of those thousand dollars worth of tapes that you're going to buy. <laughs> Run your car to the limit. Make some decisions. Make them right now. Go out of here and become a decisive person. Always decide. Don't drag. Don't be halting between two opinions. The Bible says that a wavering man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord or from the law. The law of mind, the law of creativity. You got to be definite and positive. Let there be. Come on, say it in a sassy way. Let, Let there be. be. You know, having come through the church and the theological cemetery, I mean seminary, <laughs> seminary, there's always an argument about what is the word of God. Well, I'll tell you what the word of God is. What you believe and say about yourself is the Word of God to you. I'm going to lay that on you again. You could go to church a billion years. You would never get that. Sit down, write that down. I'll let you stand back up. <laughs> Repeat it after me and we'll put it in the first person. What I believe and say about myself, myself. is the Word of God to me. to me. See, it means that that word is going to be God over you. That word is going to rule you. That word is going to determine your circumstances. So you, say, you don't have to argue about what's in the book. Fundamentalists think that the word of God is on paper, bound in leather. Well, in a sense, maybe it is. Your skin. <laughs> So that's the only leather that it's going to help to get the Word of God bound in your skin. Thy Word have I hid in my heart. But what you believe and say about yourself, that's the Word of God to you. I want to say it another way because it's good that we say this. You know, there's power in the Word. Do you realize that God's modus operandi of creation is the Word. I like the way God operates. Man, that dude God is something else. He stepped out and the Bible says in Genesis 1 that the earth was void and darkness covered the face of the deep. And God said, Oh, it sure is dark in here. No, that's not what God said. And God said, let there be light. light. Now, I like what it says right behind that. 
Now, I want, I want you to watch God. Come on, everybody, say, watch God. Watch say it again. Watch God. Say, watch him now, watch God. He said, let there be light. And there was light. You see, when you speak the word, it's like flipping the switch. The power goes to work. The spoken word releases the power of God in you. Now, the theologians have a good time interpreting that different ways. Now, somebody may be asking, well, who was God talking to when God said, let there be light? I'll tell you who God was talking to. God's own self-consciousness. Because all the good that you desire to be, to do, and to have is created out of your own self-consciousness. You're really speaking to yourself. You're not speaking to an other. You're speaking to the I am that I am. And it becomes whatever you believe and whatever you speak. When you speak it, you release it into demonstration. There's something else God wanted, and God said, let there be. What was it? Everything God wanted. It, it would do you good to go back to the first chapter of Genesis on your own time, not mine. <laughs> if you can find that book, you don't know where you put it. <laughs> See, I could get fundamentalist now and send you to hell for that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but go back to that first chapter of Genesis and, Genesis and watch God. Every time God wanted something, the book says, and God said. Let me hear you say that. And God said. Say it again. And God said. And God said, let there be. And God said, let there be. And there was. And there was. Wow. Wow. Look at God. Look at God. You know, I have strange ways of praying. Sometimes my prayer is, go, God, go! <laughs> Woo! Come on, stand up, let's pray that prayer. Come on, stand up, let, 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 let's, let, let, let's do that three times. Come on. Go, God! Go! Go! Go, God! Go! Go, 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 Go! All right. All right, be seated, but you better tell him where to go. See, that releases the power. And it is the prophet Isaiah speaking for the Lord God who says, My word that goes forth out of my mouth shall not return unto me void, but it shall prosper in the thing whereunto I sent it, and it shall accomplish that which I please. Now, that's not just the Almighty speaking from the from the sky. That's the Almighty speaking out of your mind, speaking out of your mouth, even if it's crooked. <laughs> even it's, if it's got no teeth in it. And I'm being ridiculous again to emphasize something, the power of the spoken word. But you've got to begin with what? Decision. You've got to decide it. You see, you can't even speak anything worthwhile until you decide it. The first thing that you do when you want to break through and you want to be, to do, and to have something is what? Decide it. Decide it. Then miracles start happening. If you would just decide, miracles would start happening. Because, you, you know, even God doesn't know what to do for you until you decide. Even Jesus said to the blind man, What wilt thou that I should do unto you? The scribes and Pharisees standing by said, No, he's supposed to be such a great teacher, such a great spiritual master. He should know. Can't he see that the man is blind? But the point is, God wants to show us that we've got to make a decision. We've got to decide it and we've got to say it. I like this verse of Scripture from somewhere in the Bible. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say that. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. 
You see, some of you, you ain't getting nothing because you ain't saying nothing. You ain't deciding nothing and ain't saying nothing. By the way, if you didn't hear, that lady who asked, should she get the book or should she come to the seminar? Because she only had $15 and it would either be the book or the seminar. And I told her if God couldn't provide $15 for her to come to the seminar by, and getting the book yesterday to shuck him, God has just been saved. God has just been saved to shuck him. She's here. Where are you, lady? Stand up. I met her out there at the book stand. Where, where are you? Oh, there she is. Stand up. Come on. Give her a big hand. You see, that's another technique I'll throw in for the same money. You got to put God on the spot. What did I say? See, that's putting God on the spot. So she put God on the spot. I didn't ask her how she got that $15, but uh, <laughs> but you see, the, the same way that you demonstrated that, because you know, I, I talked to her out there. My goodness, when I've, when I've spoken twice on Sunday morning and you can't demonstrate $15 overnight, that doesn't say much for me, God, or anybody else. <laughs> And you see, I insist upon demonstration. All right, decide it. So she had to decide that she was going to be here, and she's here. I want to repeat this again. I want to be redundant because I want you to hear this. Ladies and gentlemen, once you make a decision, miracles will begin to happen. <laughs> Say that to the person sitting on either side of you. Make a decision and miracles will happen. Mm -hmm. That sounds so simple, but as Reverend Ike says, that is simply profound and profoundly simple. See, that's why a lot of people miss the point. You know, they're looking for profundity all the time. <laughs> and grandiose schemes. But you don't really need grandiosity. Do a simple thing like learning how to decide. From tonight on, Make it your purpose to become a more decisive person than you have ever been in your life. Even when you go to the ice cream store where they have 49 flavors. <laughs> if you don't know which one to get, get them all! <laughs> I want this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. I remember back in New York when they, they would bring me three roses, different colors, a red, a yellow, and a white, you know, depending on the, the one that I wanted to wear that particular time. And they were all so beautiful, I just couldn't decide which one. So I started wearing three. Wear them all. But at least that's a decision. And get out of this business of, halting between two opinions. Should I or shouldn't I? Should I or shouldn't I? Forget it. Uh, do something. Say to the two people next to you, do something. Do something. <laughs> now say back to them, do something yourself. <laughs> I cannot overemphasize the importance of you deciding what you want and knowing what you want.
That's another thing. I am purposely redundant. I'm not necessarily trying to say something that you haven't heard before. Because if I can get you to decide, you know, I would say this, decision is the starting point of getting what you want. Let's put it in the first person. Decision is the starting point of getting what I want. Let's hear it. Decision is the starting point of getting what I want. So you see, if you want to break out of limited situations and limited circumstances, the first thing you have to do is decide, I want to get out of here. Anybody who's been in prison, whoever broke through and broke out, <laughs> I'm sure that first of all they had to decide, I don't like it in here. I want to get out of here. And that's how it begins. But do you know something? Most people are in prison. They're in some kind of limitation. They're in some kind of limited circumstance. And I, I hope this lady is here today, but she said to me yesterday at the end of the service, as I was autographing the books and tapes, books and tapes, This is a very subtle post-hypnotic suggestion. <laughs> she said to me, Reverend Ike, which is best for me to do? To buy this book, uh, to take that money, and buy a ticket to the seminar? I said to her, do both! <laughs> she said, but I can't do both. I said, I just spoke twice today about breaking through. Let this be your first breakthrough! She said, but I only have money for one of them. I said, between now and tomorrow night, if the God you serve can't give you $15 to get to the seminar, shuck him. <laughs> you know, and I'm serious about that. <laughs> When you decide something, I mean, that puts you into action. Like I remember growing up in South Carolina in conditions just one step from slavery, in the worst poverty condition you could imagine. And I kept hearing my pastors quoting the 23rd Psalm, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Lunch was seven cents a day, and I remember days when I didn't have the seven cents to go in the lunchroom, and my nose would be pressed against the screen of the lunchroom watching my friends eat. And then I'd hear in my inner ear, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And I'd say, yeah, but then why am I out here with my belly growling? <laughs> and I actually call the Almighty into question. Oh my God, such arrogance. <laughs> But I did. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I said, God, listen. I said, I'm going to prove this word. It's in this Bible. And if it doesn't work, I'm going to shut the whole religion business. Well, I, maybe I shocked God too. But I'll tell you, when I put it to the test, I find out that it works. My friend Johnny Coleman says, it works if you work it. You see, you're not coming here so that I can do something magical to you and for you. The magic is in you. And if I can get you to decide right now, and let me tell you something. This, this I like to say, and please hear this with all your heart. Some of you have too much respect for facts. Well. I would like to do that, but <laughs> Reverend Ike has a famous tape. I think it's his most famous tape. I don't know where it is, whether it's here or not, but it is titled, Get Your Butt Out of the Way. <laughs> See, get your butts out of the way when you decide what you want. You see, a lot of you want to decide because of certain facts. I can't, I would like to do that or be that or have that, but I don't have any money. Get your no money butt out of the way. Decide it. Miracles happen when I 
make a clear decision. Say that. Miracles happen You see, and you do that without respect to facts. See, that no money but is a big but. But you've got to get it out of the way. Just make the decision, and I'll tell you something. When you make the decision, facts will get out of your way, and instead of being obstacles, they will become stepping stones. Get that attitude that we used to have down in South Carolina when we would say, okay, get with me, get out of the way, or get run over, because I'm coming through. So this is not just something to sit around and study and say, oh, isn't it nice what Ernest Holmes said? <laughs> well, you're right as far as that goes. But you got to do better than that. Oh, isn't God wonderful? Yes, that's right as far as that goes. But you got to come to the point where you decide what you want, the good that you want to be, to do, and to have, and say, Go, God! Go! Let's hear it again! Go, God! Go! See, tell God what you want. Now, that may sound sacrilegious to some of you, but there is a verse of Scripture in the Bible where the Lord says, Command you me. Wow. It's in Job somewhere. Terry is going to find it for us, and after the break, he'll tell us where. Some of you fundamentalists don't believe a thing unless, you, unless I thump the Bible at you. But imagine that. The infinite God in you says, command you me. Isn't that awesome? Let me hear you say, that's awesome. That's awesome. Say it again. Awesome. Say it again. Who's that brother there? I, got, I finally got an amen call. Stand up and show them how you say that. All right. I knew I had an amen corner here somewhere. That's awesome. Touch the person next to you on both sides and say, that's awesome. On several occasions when certain people encountered Jesus in his ministry, Jesus asked a very beautiful question, really giving the person a blank check. Jesus said in Elizabethan English of the King James translation, What wouldst thou that I should do unto thee? Let's translate it in, let's translate it for a moment into the language of the boys in the hood. <laughs> it means, what's happening, baby? Yeah, yo, what's happening, baby? <laughs> what it is? What's up? <laughs> what do you want? What do you want me to do for you? Listen, people, and this, this excites me. And, and, you know, that's, that's something else. You've got to get excited about what you want. See, that's another thing. Some of you, you know why you don't get nothing? You ain't excited about nothing. <laughs> hey, you have no excitement. I can look at some of you out there right now. <laughs> Lord, I, want, I hope I get my $15 worth. <laughs> and I've got to buy books and tapes, too. <laughs> But honestly, I mean, your excitement has power. That's God's power. You see, make your decision and make it with excitement. Let me hear you say, I'm excited and delighted. I'm excited and delighted. So you got to be excited. You see, if what you want to be, to do, and to have doesn't excite you, start over. <laughs> when you write that question, what do I want, or what in the hell do I want to be, to do, and to have? And you write those things down and look at them. If they don't excite you, rub them off and start over. Make
make a decision that excites you. Let me hear you say, I am excited about my decision. I'm excited about the good that I desire to be, to do, and to have. Yeah, you see, you got to go forth into life with a tiger in your tank. And when you decide it, you've got to do what? Believe it. On one occasion, Jesus asked one of the blind men who applied to him for healing, do you believe that I'm able to do this? And he replied in two great words, yes, Lord. In this teaching, that would indicate yes, law, meaning that you have an affirmative attitude toward the law which works to bring you to the demonstration of the good that you believe. There's an old gospel song that the late Clara Ward used to sing back in the 40s, long before any of you kids were born. Surely God is able. Say that. Say it again. Surely God is able. The third time. Surely God is able. And I like to make it so very personal and say it this way. Surely God in me is able. Say it again. Surely God in me is able. There's one place in the Bible, is it the 11th chapter of Hebrews, where it says, without faith it is impossible. But when you believe, nothing is impossible. So you got to believe it. Now let's move on to the third step to help you break out into the good that you desire and break through. Number three says, see it. Let's hear it. See it. This deals with visualization. Now, I've got a tape on visualization that is not here. I wish it's a whole album. There are some visualization treatments on some of these tapes. And particularly, yes, on this one, Money-Making Miracle Working Idea. But I have, and I think that tape is now titled Your Master Power. And if you write and grovel for it and pay for it, I'll send it to you. <laughs> but there's a visualization treatment here. It is important that you learn how to work in the theater of your mind. And I want to leave that term with you. Say, the theater of my mind. And usually in my visualization treatments in that particular tape, when I would conduct visualizations, I would say, I now enter into the theater of my mind and look upon the stage of my imagination. See, so you've got it set there. And, you, and then I will say, I see myself. And then you describe yourself as you wish to be. So repeat this after me. I now look upon, I now enter the theater of my mind, and look upon the stage of my imagination, and I see myself as I wish to be. Oh, there I am. Look how healthy I am. Look how happy I am. Listen to the way I'm laughing. I'm just the exact weight that I want to be. Look at that. My dimensions are as I would have them to be. Just look at me. And look at all that money around me. Ooh. Look at all of those stocks and bonds certificates.
Okay. Buy the tape. <laughs> I don't have time to do the whole thing. That's the good thing about these tapes. You can take Reverend Ike home with you. You can listen to him. Like one lady, one lady came out there to me a while ago and says, Reverend Ike, I bought those tapes from you the last time that, that, that you were here. And she said, they're all worn out. Can I send them back? I said, no, honey, please don't send them back. Buy some more and wear them out, too. <laughs> so learn how to see yourself being, doing, and having the good that you desire. Enter the theater of your mind. Look upon the stage of your imagination and see yourself. And it's important that you see yourself being, doing, and having the good that you desire. I remember some years ago, I uh, drove up to our place up in the mountains in, in Monterey overlooking the, the ocean, and my custodian at that time was a very fine gentleman who met me outside, and he saw that brand new mink, silver, gray, and blue Rolls Royce Corniche. <laughs> and he said to me, he says, Oh, Reverend Ike, he said, I saw this car in my visualization the other day. I say, yeah, but you made one mistake. You didn't see yourself with it. <laughs> so I got it. Now, that's another thing, and I want to warn you about this. You know, a lot of people are good at visualizing things for other people. Yeah, that's for Rockefeller. <laughs> that's for those rich people. You'll pass by those mansions in Bel Air and Beverly Hills and say, look, this is where the rich people live. Look, look at that. That's for them. And you're really telling yourself, well, that's for them. I see them with it, but I don't see myself with it. Okay. If you can see it for other people, why can't you see it for yourself? I taught people to do this. Here's a little technique. That whenever you see people being, doing, and having good, always be glad for them. Always rejoice for them. And, you know, say good things about them in your mind. I said, look at that old rich so-and-so. The Bible says, curse not the rich. Reverend Ike says, if you curse the rich, you'll never be one of us. <laughs> now, now, let me finish the technique with you. So, whenever you see people prospering, Always rejoice and bless them in your heart. Always do that. And you see, you magnetize yourself for that good when you bless other people. But you know, if you have a jealous spirit, oh, look at that. Why should they have that when I've got so little? Yeah, because you, you work, you operate your mouth against yourself. That's why. There's a verse of Scripture also say, that says, Thou art ensnared by the words of thy mouth. You know, the mouth can be a dangerous thing until you learn how to operate it positively. <laughs> Some people are like a prosecuting attorney against themselves. <laughs> Every time you think of something good, you talk yourself out of it. Yeah, but I know, I just know, I, I sure wish. No, but I can't. But oh, I sh Lord, I sure wish. Thou art ensnared by the words of thy mouth. Don't do that. Now, what was I talking about? Yes, you've got to see it. You remember Flip Wilson, the comic, who used to say, what you see is what you get. That's true. And the man who said to me, well, Reverend Ike, I saw this Rolls Royce Carnation in my visualization. He made the mistake. He didn't see himself with it. So, also, when you see people with good, Always say also, and when you pass those fine homes, fine cars, people are looking good, say, that's for me. Let me hear you say it. That's for me. Say it again. That's for me. See, bless it, bless them, and say, that's for me. See, that means that you include yourself in that idea of good. The next point. Once you decide it, then you must believe it. Let me hear you say, believe it. Believe it. 
And the book says belief is mental acceptance. You have to mentally accept what you want. The late Emmett Fox used to use the term the mental equivalent. Let me hear you say the mental equivalent. And I'm going to say it this way. First of all, I'll quote Jesus on it. Jesus says, To him that hath, to him it shall be given. The only thing that you're going to get is what you've got. Get it? That's right. Somebody said, got it. That's what you're supposed to say. And someone says, my goodness, you left me somewhere back there at the first got, Reverend Ike. The only thing that you are going to get is what you've got. First of all, this is another way that Reverend Ike says it. If you want something, first get it in your mind. It's in this book somewhere. Until you get it in your mind, you're not going to get it in your hand or in your bank account or in your garage <laughs> or in your pocket. You must have the mental equivalent. This book will help you to get it. I'll read just one sentence. When you believe in yourself, you become unstoppable. And there's that old saying, where there is a will, there is a way. So I'm going to save the other two points until after the break, which we're going to take in just a moment, because I want you to have your books in your hands <laughs> on page 184. Now, we have breakthrough tools here. Some of the best breakthrough tools are books and tapes so that you can hear the word. You know, we talked about the importance of the word. I have a habit, and, and I'm going to refine this into a seminar. I've promised myself that I was going to do that. I record all of my favorite verses of scripture, all of my favorite affirmations. I've recorded them onto tapes and I affirm each one 10 times. And sometimes at a low level so that it doesn't disturb my conscious mind, I will play maybe three of those tapes all night. You see, because the conscious mind has unlimited input. You see, that's where you pick up a lot of stuff and don't know where you got it from. See, that headache that you get, you caught that five months ago on the secret storm in the edge of night. <laughs> You'd be surprised at stuff that your, your subconscious picks up from those commercials. See, they've got you all primed for that. Not only do they tell you and show you how to have a headache, they tell you what kind of headache to have. <laughs> You've got an excedrin. Cross it out. Headache. So when you go to the store, you'll see that pass that excedrin rack and that Pallovian response will say, oh yes, this is just what I need. And you will definitely need it. <laughs> anyway, you want to take these classes and these services with you, and you can do that on tape. I've brought several very good tapes and books here with us. One I call the Master of Money Course. Heaven knows if you are interested in coming to a greater understanding and a unique understanding about money so that you can experience it more than ever before. Whatever you need to do that's honest to get this tape, you do it. It contains the series Magnetize Your Mind for Money, the Ten Commandments of Money, and the Psychology of Money. And then there's one, the Master of Prosperity course. It tells you about prosperity, your divine right. You see, it's your divine right. You see, that's another thing. You know, when you pray, a, a lot of people pray to ask God for things. But you know, what you, everything that you ask for is really already yours. Say that to the person next to you. Everything that you ask for is really already yours. <laughs> see? And it is by prayer and by praise and by believing and by decision that we take what is already ours. 
Beloved, I wished above all things that you would prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers, says the Bible. So prosperity is your divine right. And you need to understand that. You see, you're not asking God for something that's not yours. You see, you can't get what's not yours. That's the trouble with some of you. You've been trying to get what's not yours. <laughs> I have many reputations, and one is a faith healer. I remember one night in, in Miami, Florida, at the convention center, the building was crowded to the rafters, and I was praying my mass healing prayer for everybody. And, you know, some of the people dropped their crutches and jumped up and started running. Other people got out of wheelchairs and, and had all kinds of instant demonstrations. There was a little lady there with rheumatism, and so she was sitting on the front row rubbing her knees and, Oh, please, Jesus, please, Jesus, please. I looked at her and said, Mama, stop praying like that! <laughs> she almost dropped her teeth. You have to learn what your divine rights are. Good health is my divine right. Let's hear it. Good health is my divine right. And this Master of Prosperity course tells you about that. It also tells you how to be crazy enough to get what you want. See, <laughs> I'm going to level with you just before the break. Whenever an evangelist say that, you know, he's going to be through in just a few minutes, never take him seriously, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. The reason some of you people don't have what you want is because some of you have got too much sense. If you're going to be successful, if you're not already crazy, you have to learn how to be crazy without acting crazy. <laughs> people with good sense don't get but so far. You know why? Because they know too well why they can't. <laughs> Oh, I, I, no, I can't do that. And then you got to watch out for these relatives and friends of yours that always tell you, well, you know, you can't do that. How many of you have ever tell, had people tell you what you could do and could do? Get the heaven away from those kind of people. <laughs> even if they are your relatives, don't even get your post office box and don't even let them know what your address is. <laughs> Send them a Christmas card every Christmas. I wish you a Merry Christmas. I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And let it stay at that, but don't talk on the telephone with him. <laughs> you get enough static from yourself. You don't need a lot of other people giving you static. <laughs> you don't need Mama's static and Daddy's static and Aunt Susie's static. And Aunt Jay, all Aunt Jay, and some of you to go to visit your relatives every year, you need to stop that. <laughs> because you don't get the gospel, you get all the bad news. And he'll tell you about all the stuff that runs in the family. <laughs> so, well, you know that, you know what. Uh, yeah. Old Aunt Janie died of the rocket pneumonia and the boogie-woogie flu. That runs in our family. And I said, yeah, and this is where it runs the hell out. <laughs> but you got to be crazy enough not to believe all those negative things. Okay, well, I can't preach the tape to you here. You have to buy it. The tape in there also is, you can have it. I did that as a response to a message that I got from a reporter in Chicago some years ago when I began to preach success and prosperity to people. And the reporter sent word back to me through our director of public relations. Why is it that Reverend Ike tells, all, tells those people that he can have all those things? He knows they can't have all those things. I said, you tell him, I said, who in the heaven is he to tell people what they can't have? That's another thing. You know, write it down. Don't let anybody tell you what you can't have. Don't let anybody tell you what you can't be. And the fifth tape in here is don't be indifferent toward money. You know, some of you, you're having money problems because you're indifferent to money and you don't even realize how indifferent you are. I had an interesting experience today. 
um, somebody that, that I hired to, to work for me, you know, we, had, we put an ad in the paper, but that, that, was, that ad was a doozy. It said, controversial minister. I did that to scare away the weak-hearted. <laughs> but somehow this particular person came for the interview and got hired. And one day of me, she couldn't stand it. And so when the supervisor came to me and said, well, you know, she's not going to make it because, you know, her religion is bothering her being around here. <laughs> I said, well, if her religion bothers her, then, you know, release her and let her go. Pay her off for the day. She worked one day. He said, well, she said that uh, the money isn't important. See that? That's indifference to money. See, and what probably rubbed her the wrong way is, you know, my concept of, of the right relationship with money and so on. And so it seemed overemphasized to her. I don't know what all the other hang-ups were, but I tried to warn them. <laughs> but I said, my religion insist that I pay people. She worked here a day, so she's going to get paid for a day. So just prorate whatever we agreed to pay her and pay her for that day. Tell her we'll mail her the check. Goodbye, and God bless you. Till you're ready for me. <laughs> okay, and all of these tapes, the power, your power of fascination. That's a, this is a beautiful little set, your power of fascination. There's only one tape in here, but it is so beautiful because it tells you how to use your power of fascination. You can use your power of fascination. We, when we talk about all these different powers, they're really the same. They're aspects of the same one power. But when you horn in on your power of fascination, you can use it to bring you what you want. I talked about this, the excitement of money, overflowing abundance, get your kicks. <laughs> Money-making, miracle-working idea, technique that does the trick. And there's a money-hook, money-feeling meditation included in here. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's in there, believe it or not. How to get out of the hell of poverty, sickness, and suffering. Prosperity plus. You don't have to go through hell to get to heaven. Oh, Lord. I can look at you and tell some of you, you've been going through hell trying to get to heaven. Oh, Lord, is hell trying to get to heaven. <laughs> I remember in, in, in the black church back in South Carolina, and by the way, you know, I do know a lot about black people because I used to be black before I turned green. <laughs> But you know what I found out? I found out that um, I couldn't buy anything with black power. <laughs> the only color of power in the American economy is green power. And if you get enough of that, people don't care what color your face or anything else is. <laughs> A beautiful set. Control your life series. Tell your mind what to think. Tell your feelings how to feel. Tell your body how to react. Woo, that'll fix you up. <laughs> Reverend Ike also has another tape. I don't know whether it's here or not, but it's titled, I Meet No One But Me. Yeah. That's, a, that's a heavy trip. You see, everybody that you meet, even the SOB is you. You are your own devil, you are your own God, and none can decide the path you must trod. And none can save you from error or sin unless you listen to the spirit within. All right? So those negative people you met are telling you of your negatives that you need to work on. And, and let me say this, and then I'll have to move on from this one, but this is very important because a lot of people have, as I said, I've seen them come into this teaching and they make a tremendous demonstration. And boy, they're on cloud nine, like this lady said she was before she left out of here. But during the break, she met some negative people. Those were your own negatives that you stirred up. 
And you really don't know how, how many negatives you've got until you stir them up with your positives, you see. And you've got to deal with them. Remember in the Gospels, it tells us a very interesting thing, and I did a series on that called Lessons, Blessings, and Tessons. I have not released that yet to you metamagicians because that's sort of Pentecostal preaching too, but it is extremely metaphysical. Let me hear you say lessons, blessings, and tessons. Lessons, blessings, and tessons. The Gospels tell us that Jesus fasted 40 days. And after he had fasted 40 days, the first thing he met was the devil. Now, if I would ever fast 40 days, I wouldn't ever expect to see that fellow again. <laughs> but you see, the fact is, the more spiritual-minded you become, and when you tend to watch spiritual things, then you really stir up those negatives within yourself, and you have to meet them and correct them. Every soul must meet its devils. You must meet all of your negatives. Oh, God. Reverend Ike, I sure don't feel, I felt good before too, but I don't feel... <laughs> <laughs> See, but at least you know what's happening. And you can say, well, this is my devil, and so I'm going to straighten him out. Let me hear you say that. <laughs> you got to meet him. And you see, Jesus met, and one of the devils that Jesus met was the devil of self-doubt, because it is said that the devil said to him... If you be the Son of God, turn these stones to bread. And notice the, you, you can tell when the devil comes along. You have to bear with me. You understand I'm going between fundamentalism and esoteric science all at the same time, but it'll come out right. <laughs> the devil said, if you be the Son of God. And Reverend Ike says in those tapes, one thing that you never do, you never if with the devil. Some of you are not saved. <laughs> Never. Now, where was that devil coming from? From the area of self-doubt. To get the man of the mind to doubt his divine sonship or his divine paternity. That's where the devil comes in one attack. Your self-doubt. Let me hear you say the devil of self-doubt. Self but you see, you've got to meet that devil. But when you meet that devil, that's when you need to know the word. And you see, Jesus defeated that devil of self-doubt with the word. He said, get behind me, Satan, it is written. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. In other words, he was saying, devil, I am God to you, and I'm not going to let you kick my behind. I'm going to kick yours. <laughs> See why I don't let you metamagicians have those tapes? Anyway, everybody's got to meet his devils, and you'll meet your devils in various people and in various things, and you've got to meet them at some point or the other. And during that particular series, and that was about four years, about three years ago, about three summers ago now, I think, I did something that I'm having to deal with. I stood there and I said, whatever it is in me that needs to be straightened out, I said, come on, I'm ready for you. Matter of fact, what I said, I said, come on, mother, I'm ready. <laughs> and did they ever come? Oh, <laughs> uh, there's, there's stuff came up that I can't even tell you about. You know, I started finding out a whole lot of things that I needed to straighten out. A whole lot of people went out of my life. <laughs> okay. So, be not, don't, don't despair when you meet your devil. Just say, well, this is something that I need to clean up. Let me hear you say, this is something I need to clean up. You know, just, just stay prayerful and clean it up. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to say to you flat out, God really demands of you that you be rich. And listen, this, I am that. Thank you. Say it, I am that I am.
That is demanded of you. You were put here, planted here by God in this dimension at this time to be productive. And you are expected, you see, to be productive and fruitful and giving. As a matter of fact, Jesus approached that fig tree to get something from it. So it tells you, yes, the infinite gives you its infinite self. It is, it's infinite abundance, individualized in you, through you, and as you. And as such, demands something back from you. You see, that's another secret of being successful and prosperous, to be a giver. A tree produces, a tree gives. Is that correct? And whether the fruit is taken from it or not, if nobody comes and gets the fruit, it drops it on the ground. And the seed goes into the ground and plants other trees. And the birds of the air and the wind scatter those seeds all over the earth so that there is continual reproduction. Oh, I tell you, this God business is productive. Say that. This God business is productive. This is demanded of you. And so Jesus was saying to that fig tree, look, if you're not going to produce anything, get out of the way and let somebody else get there who will produce. You know, you'd be surprised how, you know, you can miss your blessing by not being productive. Well, that's all I can say this time. It's, it's been wonderful being with you, but let's do, let's do the closing treatment and then we're going to go home. I'm going to go out there and sign books and ushers keep all the doors locked and the parking lots blocked. <laughs> until we've sold every book and tape. <laughs> so this is, the, this is the closing benediction. It's the closing affirmation. And we're going to go out to the book stand after this. So just shout this after me. I am God's loving child. I am God's loving child. I am God's productive child. I am God's giving child. I am God's giving child. I am God's rich child. I am God's rich child. I am rich in every way. I am rich in every way. Including, including good health, good health happiness, happiness, love. Success, success, prosperity, prosperity and, infinite money. and infinite money. Good night. <laughs>